brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, when the uh, restrictions that were placed on us as a result of the COVID pandemic were announced uh, initially five weeks ago, um, we as ministers um, just felt uh, convicted uh, that we would uh, go into the season uh, doing uh, the best that we can and do everything that we can uh, for as long as we can um, in terms of ministry. And so we continue to uh, worship in a particular way. We continue to worship as the church scattered. We continue to worship and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ through uh, video and through devotional writings. Uh, we continue to encourage people to keep in contact with one another, to maybe uh, join some of the care groups that have been formed over this while, uh, just to get us through uh, pastorally and psychologically. Uh, under less uh, than uh, perfect uh, conditions, uh, we've continued to minister to the most vulnerable in society. And uh, there have been uh, some of you who have contributed to this ministry. And so we thank you so much uh, for that. We continue to uh, reach out and to uh, offer food uh, to those who are not able to uh, afford uh, food in shops. And so, uh, we continue in ministry uh, in this particular way on this Sabbath day, uh, doing the best we can uh, for as long as we can, awaiting the day when we can experience uh, the church gathered together again. On uh, this, the uh, second Sunday of the empty cross and the empty tomb, uh, we're going to be led in a song of worship and a reflection uh, that begins our focus over the next couple of weeks. A focus on the gift of resurrected life, the gift that uh, Christ offers when evil, when sin, when suffering and when death have done everything that they can do. It's the gift of grace, a gift received as we open ourselves up to the resurrected presence of Jesus Christ in us and amongst us. And so welcome to this time of worship on the Sabbath day. We pray together. Father, we come before you and we just praise you uh, for sending your Son to be our Saviour. Praise you for the gift of resurrection life. That life that is available not only in our physical dying, but also in every other moment of dying. The death of life as we know it. The death of opportunity, the death of capacity, and the death of health. The death of relationship, the death of hope. Father, as we consider our life uh, as a nation, we think of the deaths that we currently and uh, the deaths that we will experience as a result of the COVID-19 virus. And we hold on to your offer uh, to always restore where the unwelcome realities of this world are experienced. And so Father, in all these deaths, uh, the grace of your Son visits the grace of your Son walks with us, it reawakens us, it revives us, it re-energizes us. And so we praise you. We praise you that you are greater than the greatest evil, bigger than the biggest sin, more far-reaching than the most threatening pandemic, and more powerful than death itself. Father, this is what we have learned from you in Jesus Christ over this Easter period that the evil, the sin, the suffering of this world was taken to the cross and that after death you robbed the grave of its power and you raised Christ to life for as long as eternity. And so Father we want to open ourselves up to you in this moment. We want to open ourselves up to you for to receive the gift of life after death. Speak to us so that those parts of our current living that are dead may be brought to life. Amen.
Gracious Father, we thank you that you are with us every moment of every day. We pray that you would be with us now and that you would speak to us clearly as we read your scriptures. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. This morning we start a new series, Resurrection Life. And the idea behind the series is that we're going to be looking at different stories throughout the gospel of how encounters with Jesus led to new life for people. And then we're going to be asking the question of what do those stories say to us today? And so our first story comes from the Gospel of John. It's from John chapter 11. It's the story of how Lazarus was raised from the dead. And so I'd like to read from verse 38 through to verse 44. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Thanks be to God for his word. I wonder how you're doing today. I wonder how the news of the extension of the lockdown has treated you. But more than that, I, I wonder about the story. I love how Jesus encounters a story where somebody has lost a loved one. And I love the response of Jesus. Don't you find it amazing that Jesus looks at the story, he, he finds out about Lazarus, and then at the end of the story, he raises Lazarus from the dead. It reminds me, I've been reading a book by Trevor Hudson called Touched by Resurrection Life. Or resurrection love. And in one of the chapters, one of the things that Trevor says at the end of the chapter is that we are Easter people in a Good Friday world. And I think of this story and I think that this is Jesus being an Easter person in a Good Friday world. In other words, when he was faced with death, he brought about life. And I had to think that for us today, we are facing a Good Friday world. And so the question is, how can we, like this, like Jesus, like this story, participate in the resurrection work of Jesus Christ? How can we be Easter people? How can we make a difference? And so I look at this story, and the story actually starts at the beginning of chapter 11, but I didn't have time to read the whole chapter. And so I'd encourage you to, after the service, perhaps spend some time and read the whole of chapter 11. But there are a few things that I'd like to pull out of this chapter in order to discuss how we can be Easter people in a Good Friday world. The first thing that strikes me is that at the beginning of the chapter, the beginning of chapter 11, people come to Jesus and they say to him, Lazarus, your friend, is deathly ill. And Jesus waits where he is for a couple of days before deciding to go to Bethany. And when he decides to go to Bethany, he says to his disciples, he says, come guys, we are going to go and see Lazarus. And the disciples hesitate and they actually say this to him. They say this. <laughs> but Rabbi, they said, I'm reading from verse 8. A short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you and yet you are going back there. And Jesus answers them, he says, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. <laughs> After that, he says to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. I love this part because the disciples look at Jesus and they go, Jesus, you know what? Like, we should not go back there. It is dangerous. Let us stay where we are. 
let's not go there. I think for me, that's the first thing is if, if we want to participate in the work that Jesus is doing, if we want to participate in this resurrection life, if we want to be Easter people in a Good Friday world, the first thing we need to do is we need to actually face death. We need to face death. Now you're probably wondering what on earth do I mean when I say face death? And this is what I mean is the disciples, when they heard Jesus wanted to go there, they thought to themselves, no ways, Jesus, we cannot go there. It is too dangerous. But Jesus wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to face the death head on. When they got to the tomb and Jesus says, open up the tomb, everyone says, Lord, you don't want to do that because it's going to smell. So people constantly were afraid of facing what was happening. And yet Jesus faces death. What does that mean for us today? What exactly am I saying? I think today there's a temptation for us as people to hide from the reality of the brokenness of this world. There's a temptation for us to try and avoid it, to, to stay safely inside and say things like, oh, but we're safe here and it's okay here. What if I had to say that part of our call of being Christ followers is to actually face death? See, we can never live resurrected lives if we do not actually first face the death. This season that we're in as a country has perhaps highlighted the reality of death more than any other time. And I'm not only speaking about the death in terms of people who've died from the virus. I'm speaking about far more than that. I'm speaking about the, the, the death of our economy. I'm speaking about the reality that there are some people in our country who have so much. There are some of us that are so rich. Yeah, there are some of us that are lucky enough in this lockdown to be living in nice houses with separate bedrooms and, and swimming pools and entertainment areas and decent kitchens. And yet there are others that live in nothing. I think just down the road from our houses, there are people that are living, five or six people at a time, living in all the broken down toilets. thinking of the people that we met a community where they are considered the bush people by the authorities because they live out in the open they have no shelter hundreds of them young old children some of them disabled black white colored indian doesn't matter they're living together out in the bush they're known as the bush people think of the stories when 19 Children and one adult live together in a three by six meter shack. You know, and these are realities that we live with every day. But the temptation is like the disciples to say, I'm not going to look at that because I'm safe here. Or I'm not going to roll away that stone because I don't want to face the smell. But if we want to be Easter people in a Good Friday world, the first thing we need to do is actually face up to the brokenness, face the death. I'm not only speaking about the difference between rich and poor, I'm not only speaking about the economic death of this country, but then I'm speaking about nature. You know, if this season has taught us anything, it's taught us just how we have oppressed creation. And as soon as people took to their houses and weren't always in the streets, nature has come alive again. There are birds in their thousands on the beaches, dolphins swimming in the waves, turtles laying their eggs in peace. We need to, it's time that we face the death and it's not comfortable speaking about it and it's not nice hearing about it. But if we do not face up to it, we will always just be safe in our homes, but we will never be Easter people in a Good Friday world. I think about our homes and families and how many of us in the season perhaps have realized that our families, we're not connected. We've been so busy, so preoccupied with being important that we haven't connected with the people in our lives. And now we sit with empty, broken families who are forced to live together and don't know how. Think of those in abused households. 
I, th I think of those of us who for so long we've been hiding from our inner selves and now that we have some time on our hands those inner ghosts those those parts of our being that we've been able to resist for so long are starting to show and we realize that we're not okay See, it's time that we face the death. It's time that we looked to what is real and faced it head on and rolled away the stone. Only then can we start being Easter people in a Good Friday world. But that's not the only thing that happens as Jesus is willing to face the death. But then something else happens and it's the beautiful part of the story. Is that Jesus on his way, he goes and he sees Martha. And he speaks to Martha and Martha then calls Mary. And this is the story with Mary. From verse 28, after this, Martha went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going from the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Thanks be to God for his word. See, this is something amazing about Jesus. And perhaps it's our second points of how we can become people who are more like Easter people in a Good Friday world. But the second thing that happens is that Jesus feels. See, Jesus faced death and then Jesus felt it. One of my occupational hazards, if I could call it that, is the temptation to become numb. See, see I've been dealing with funerals and grief and mourning since I was about 16 years old. I've heard stories that people have shared. And the temptation is that sometimes it feels easier to just become numb, to not feel anymore. But when I look at Jesus and I hear this story, Jesus wept. He knew the end of the story. He knew Lazarus was going to be raised from the dead. He knew everything was going to be okay. But he drew alongside his friends, the people around him, and he wept with them. See, Jesus was never numb to human emotion. And, and sometimes we think that as spiritual people, what we're called to do is we're called to not be emotional. Maybe that's the opposite. Maybe we are called to be emotional. Maybe we are called to feel. You see, if we face death and we don't ever feel, then we become inhumane. Whereas Jesus faced death and then he felt. He actually allowed himself to feel. I think we've become experts at not feeling. I think we've become experts as escaping. Maybe, maybe if you're anything like me, in this season I've tried to escape the reality, even if it's just for a while by watching Netflix or being on social media. Yeah, I've seen people try and escape the reality through strange Facebook challenges that involve egg. <laughs> and I'm not saying those things are wrong, and I'm not saying that those things are bad, but what I am saying is let's not use them as tools to escape the feelings that we're feeling. You know, Jesus embraced human emotion because he knew that human emotion was important. 
And so let's give ourselves time to feel what we're feeling. And if we're lonely, let's give ourselves time to feel it. And if we feel guilty, let's give ourselves time to feel it. And if we feel heartbroken, let's give ourselves time to feel it. Let's feel those emotions because they were given to us by God. Let's not get stuck there. Let's not get stuck there. But let's allow those emotions to sit with us for a while. And know this. Know that as we weep, Jesus weeps with us. That as we mourn, he mourns with us. God is the creator of our emotions. So he doesn't long for us to escape from them. But to use them. See, so that's the two things for me is the first thing that happens is that we should not hide away from death. We need to face death. The second thing is we actually need to feel. Let's not become numb to the stories of the people in our country. Let's not hide away. Let's not try and escape all the time. Let's not keep ourselves so entertained in this season that we manage to escape it. Because if we do, we'll never be part of the movement of Jesus where we are called to be Easter Sunday in a Good Friday world. Sometimes those emotions are what's needed to move us into action. But if we had to stop there, if we had to only face death and feel the emotions, what would happen is we would become a depressed people. Is that We would become hopeless. We would become overwhelmed and we would become stuck in darkness. And so perhaps the third point is probably the most important. And the third point is this, is let us then do something vitally important and that's listen. Listen for the voice of God. Listen to the voice of Jesus as he approaches death and he looks inside that tomb and he calls out to Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus is looking at you and I and he's watching us and he is saying to us and some of us feel dead inside. Some of us are facing our own death and we're thinking maybe this is how God likes it. That is not true. God likes life. Jesus brings life. He never brings death. And Jesus isn't only obsessed with our spiritual lives. He, he loves our physical life as well. Every time he faced sickness and suffering, Jesus always offered healing. After all, God made this life. Why would he not want the best for it? And so if we are like Lazarus stuck in a tomb, then let us hear the voice of Jesus as he calls us by name, as he says, Louise, come forth. As he says to you by name, come forth and may you rise up as I rise up. And yes, there might be traces of the death still clinging to us. But then let's find ways of removing it. Reach out that someone can help us. Take off those grave clothes and live. But Jesus doesn't only call us to come out of the tomb, but probably the most beautiful call is the call that he had to Mary. So Martha goes to Mary and says, Mary, the teacher is here and he's asking for you. Never forget a couple of years ago, Kylie spoke about the story. And the one thing that she just said over and over again is those words, the teacher is here and he is asking for you. And I often think of that and I often think to myself that the teacher is here and he's asking for me. And if I could ask you that in this season, hear those words. The teacher is here and he's asking for you. The teacher is here. He's here. And he's asking for you. May you get up. 
and go to him. We, if we can do this, if we can hear the voice of God, And not be afraid to face the brokenness of this world. And allow that brokenness to touch us. But then listen for the voice of God as he calls us out of our tombs, as he calls us out of our mourning and our weeping, as he calls us to his feet. We can hear his voice. Then we truly can be moved into action and become Easter people in a Good Friday world. But what we cannot do is hide away, escape. Because surely we might be safe. But that's not resurrection life. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you that you weep with us, that you love us so much. Thank you that you don't allow us to just stay in our tombs, but you call us by name. Thank you that you don't allow us to just be stuck in our mourning, that you don't allow us to just be stuck in our heartache, but you call us forth. May we work with you so that we can be resurrection people in a Good Friday world. We pray for our country. That this inequality, that this might be the beginning of the end of all inequality. That this might be the beginning and of the end of suffering. That this might be the beginning of the end of the way that we mistreat creation. That this might be the beginning of new family values. Of deeper relationships. May this be the beginning of new life in each one of us. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen.